conservation of energy is one of the most fundamental principles in all of physics and something that they find a lot of different ways to test. We'll start out with one of the more core conservation formulas. And this is one that you use with a closed system, perhaps uh, throwing a baseball or sliding an object down an incline, or one of many different varieties where you essentially have a moving object that perhaps has some gravitational potential energy and may or may not have work done on it. So the total energy of a closed system, especially when you're dealing with mechanics, you have to look at the change in total energy being equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational energy plus the change in internal energy. For kinetic energy, your formula for this is one half mv squared, and that's one that you should have ingrained in your mind by the time you take the MCAT. Gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh, where g is the gravitational constant of, you could either say 9.8 or 10, but a lot of people choose to simplify it to 10. And h is the height of the object above where it started or above ground level. And internal energy is a concept that is often viewed as the change in heat produced or the change in work being performed on or by the system. And uh, so work is something that uh, you should become familiar with. And oftentimes work is what creates the change in the total energy of any system. Now often in a lot of conservation of energy questions, you will find that you're exchanging one for the other. For example, if you throw a baseball into the air, you're exchanging kinetic energy initially for gravitational potential energy. And oftentimes when it reaches the point of zero kinetic energy, where it comes to a complete stop in the vertical movement, that is where you've maximized your gravitational potential energy. In other cases, such as objects that are experiencing friction, you're going to be looking at work being performed on that object by the frictional force. And so get very comfortable with all of the energy formulas that you could encounter on the MCAT. These are things that could have been taught in different physics courses or even in some general chemistry courses. But all of them are capable of being tested against each other in the physical sciences section. And so what we've done here is we've created a list of all of the major energy formulas that you can be responsible for. And these are all things that can be exchanged for each other in different conservation of energy questions. Also realize that sometimes conservation of energy questions can be disguised as perhaps a kinematics type of question. Or it could be something where work is being performed. Or it could be a collision where you have MV, which is the momentum, being conserved, but you're not supposed to be looking at it as an energy conservation equation. A lot of times, the transition between kinematics and energy and also between the collisions and energy involves velocity. So when you see velocity, keep in mind that this could be tested as a kinematics equation or it could be tested as a collisions because remember that collisions involve conservation of momentum. And momentum, the formula for that is m times v, mass times velocity. So when you're doing conservation of energy, if for some reason all the pieces aren't quite, quite adding up, you can often transition by using velocity into a kinematics type of question or into a collisions type of question. But the primary thing, when you see a moving object, start to think of this formula here. The change in total energy of the system is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy, plus the change in internal energy. And oftentimes, the energy of the system will remain constant if there is no work or heat involved. The total energy of the system will be constant, so you'll see kinetic energy being exchanged for gravitational and vice versa. But this is the place to start when you see moving objects. And then we'll move into all of the different energy formulas that you can encounter on the MCAT and which can be converted from one form into another. Because of the way that physics and chemistry classes are taught, you've often been introduced to these formulas in different places. And this might be the first time that you've seen all of these formulas in one place all together. But this is useful because oftentimes that's what's being tested on the MCAT is can you make the connections between, let's say, heat, which is something you deal with a lot in general chemistry, and maybe something else like the energy of a photon or work or many other concepts that can be tested in a conservation of energy framework. 
So we'll go through all of these and then I'll pose a few examples of where these are converted for other forms of energy and that will help you get your mind ready for when you deal with a somewhat unusual looking conservation of energy question. So we'll start with this, E equals mc squared, which is a very famous formula and you'll most often see when you're dealing with nuclear reactions. Anytime where nuclei are being fused or when nuclear fission is going on and pieces are separating. When that occurs, you'll often see a mass defect or in some cases you might even see mass being produced. And the way that matter or mass interacts with energy is through this formula E equals mc squared. So often this is something whenever you're seeing a nuclear reaction, this is something you should be thinking about. E equals mc squared and that's how nuclear power can be used to perform other things. And so if nuclear power is being generated or nuclear energy, then you're looking at an E equals mc squared type of question. The energy of a photon, and keep in mind this is a photon, this is a light wave or something perhaps in the microwave spectrum or the ultraviolet spectrum. This is some form of light energy. That energy is equal to H times F where H is Planck's constant. Planck's constant is a number you don't need to memorize but is something that they'll often be giving to you on the MCAT if it comes up. The potential energy of an elastic medium and uh, oftentimes that elastic medium is a spring but it can be anything that obeys Hooke's law. Remember that Hooke's law says that force equals K, the spring constant, times X. Anything that obeys that, so that could be padding, that could be a spring. The potential energy that can be stored in that is going to be equal to K times the change in position squared. And then you divide that by two. So the potential energy of any elastic medium is K times delta X squared divided by two. And notice that that is also the work that is performed by a spring as it moves a certain distance. This is uh, something you'll often see that potential energy and work can be considered together. This is something you'll also see, for example, in uh, electrical potential energy type equations. With work, there are two ways that it can be expressed. The one you're probably familiar with is work being equal to force times distance. That's one of the more fundamental physics formulas you deal with. But it can also be equal to pressure times volume if there is a change in volume or perhaps even a change in pressure. And that is something that you'll encounter when you're dealing with fluid systems. So work is equal to force times distance or pressure times volume. The really interesting thing is that these are actually the same type of formula because you can look at volume as an area over a certain distance. So if you have some area, some object with a surface area and you move it a certain distance, then what you're looking at here is a volume that you have produced. So remember that volume can be expressed as area times distance. And one of the more important fluid formulas you'll use is that pressure is equal to force per unit of area like that. Notice that when we multiply these together, the areas cancel out and you get force times distance by looking at the PV formula. So just recognize that this is still work, but it's expressed in a more three-dimensional area-based way. And so that's something to be aware of, that if you're dealing with a fluid system, the PV work is essentially the same as your FD work that you're doing in a non-fluid based system. But the bottom line is work can be expressed in two different ways and in both cases this work is something that is either going to be adding energy to the system or removing energy from the system and it plays a very important role in conservation of energy. Now, if you're working with a very simple closed system that doesn't undergo any change in internal energy, so there is no heat or work that you have to consider, then you're simply looking at the total energy being equal to the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy. You see this a lot. This is one where you have a falling object that starts from rest. This could be one where you throw an object into the air or where an object is shot into the air. Any case where you're essentially exchanging kinetic energy for gravitational potential energy is a common motif that you'll see in a lot of physics problems and it's just simply the energy of a closed system that doesn't undergo any change in internal energy whether that's heat or work. And uh, you may also see this described as the energy of an isolated system. That's another way that it could show up on your MCAT. Electrical potential energy 
has a lot of different permutations. And these show up in different places. For example, the potential energy stored in a capacitor is equal to the charge times the voltage divided by 2, so QV over 2. If it's just a constant field, then you're looking at QV, but not divided by 2. And you could also be looking at that as QED. So it's the charge times the strength of the electrical field times the distance that it had traveled. And if you have uh, electrical energy produced by two different point charges, then the formula for electrical potential energy there is going to be K, which is your universal electricity constant, times Q1, Q2, divided by the distance between them. Or you might see this instead of a D, they might use an R, the radius between them. The last form of potential electrical energy that you'll see is power times time. Because remember that power, that power can be described as change in work over time or change in energy over time. And what that means is that if you multiply that power by time, that yields a certain amount of work or energy. And so whenever you have something that generates power, perhaps a resistor or something like that, if you know how long it is doing that, then you can figure out how much energy will be produced by that resistor. So that's another thing that plays into conservation of energy. And it connects to circuits and a lot of electrophysics and other pieces that they will like to test you on for these deep understanding questions that you might see on the MCAT. Now heat is something that is often reserved for general chemistry. And there are a few different ways you can express heat depending on the information you're provided and based on what go is going on. So heat can be expressed as C times the change in temperature. The capital C here is going to be the heat capacity of the object, the heat capacity of the entire object. And heat capacity is basically how much heat it takes to change the temperature of that object. Now you could see it as MC delta T, or some people like to remember that as Q equals MCAT. That is when you have this lowercase c, which is the specific heat. The specific heat is something that is normalized per any unit of mass. So it could be the amount of heat that it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of a compound by a degree Celsius. Or it could be the amount of uh, heat required to raise the temperature one degree Celsius for a kilogram of some particular material. So, so heat capacity and specific heat, these are two things that you have to be able to distinguish, but they're essentially related to each other. And you can kind of derive from these that specific heat, your lowercase c, is equal to heat capacity divided by mass. So that's something unlikely to be tested, but it's something that if you recognize, then it makes these questions very simple. The third thing is that if something is going, undergoing a phase change, and remember that in a phase change, it's not the heat isn't increasing the temperature of the object, but instead what it's doing is it's breaking the bonds. So it's allowing a solid to turn into a liquid, or it's allowing a liquid to turn into a gas. If that's what's going on, then you use this formula for heat, Q equals ML, where M is still the mass, and L is the latent heat. The latent heat is something that has to be overcome in order for that phase change to happen. So Q equals ML is what you're using if something is being converted from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas. This is the particular formula that you'll be using. So that is the list of major energy formulas that you'll be responsible for on the MCAT and which you can gain a lot of points on the MCAT by simply being able to recognize and convert these from one to another. One thing that a lot of my students have found fairly helpful is to look at these and try to figure out examples of where you're converting one type of energy into a different type of energy. And so, for example, a remote control car might be something where you're using electrical potential energy and converting that into kinetic energy. So that's one example there. You could have a microwave oven where you're using electrical energy, which then is turned into microwaves, which are a type of photon. And then those are used to heat your food, which is then using heat energy. So you have electrical potential energy being converted into the energy of these microwaves, which is then converted into heat. Solar panels are another example. Solar panels are something where you're using the energy in the photons that are coming down from the sun, which are usually ultraviolet waves. And those can be used either to turn directly into electrical energy, 
or they can be turned into heat and that heat can produce electrical energy as well. So one thing that can be helpful for really grasping these conservation of energy type problems is to think of examples where you can turn one type of energy into another type of energy, where you have an exchange between one form of energy and you're using it to perform some other type of work or generate electrical energy or something of that nature. And so this is the type of thing that you'll see on the MCAT a lot is they'll introduce a novel system where let's just say for example they're using a spring to generate electrical energy or something like that. It will be a novel type of system you maybe haven't seen before. But if you've done your practice and you've started to think about how conservation of energy works, then you'll be so ready to recognize that the potential energy stored by that spring can be turned into work and that work can be used to produce a lot of different changes depending on what that spring energy is being used for. So commit all of these to memory and start to think about all of these as unique distinct entities that can be converted among each other and you should be very very ready whenever conservation of energy questions come up on your MCAT.